My name is Edward Davis. I'm a vertebrate paleontologist and I study extinct mammals, things like uh, giant giraffe camels and tiny little pronghorn antelope relatives with uh, little bitty boost horns. And today I'm going to show you the project resoling these Capto Oxford shoes I bought for super cheap on eBay. They're a Florsheim brand, but they're pretty recently made, made in China, and the construction isn't as good as you would expect for some vintage Florsheims. What you'll see is that the soles are actually made of a relatively soft rubber and they're just glued to the midsole and they've come apart near the toes just from flexing of the shoe. So, uh, and then there's a lot of work I have to do on the inside of these shoes to get them to be good. I'm going to show you how I do it and I'm going to put some new Vibram soles on them and hopefully get a lot more life out of them because the uppers are actually made really well. It's just the, it's just the soles and the midsoles that are very poorly made. So I probably overpaid for these, honestly, given the condition of the soles. I paid about uh, $30 for them on eBay, including shipping. So that's the base price starting out. Uh, I think in materials I spent about $25. It's about $20 for the soles that I bought from Oregon Leather Company. I'll put a link to Oregon Leather Company in the uh, description. You can, order, you can order from the mail order if you want to do something like this at home. They're great folks, locally owned company. They've got a location in Eugene and a location in Portland, Oregon. So about $20 for the soles, including the heels, and then uh, $5 for various and sundry other stuff. If you think about, you know, I use contact cement. I've got some leather I use from scraps that I had from other projects. We're talking about maybe um, $55 total for a pair of shoes. Yeah, I think they're equivalent to... What you might see is a hundred dollar pair of shoes. There's some details that are a little bit, you know, dodgy because I'm a beginner. This is only the second pair of shoes I've, I've run a real resole project on. Third pair of shoes I've, I've done any kind of reselling on. You know, so I'm learning. But I did some some work to make them custom to me too. I I hand stitched the soles onto the welts. And since I'm hand stitching, I can actually do an alternating color pattern, which you can't do when you when you machine stitch it. Uh, so you'll see that as we go forward. Uh, that's a nice detail that, that lets you know that it was done by hand. Here I am picking away at the bottom of the stitches. Uh, so you see that these welts, they appear to be Goodyear welts from the top, but they're not really. And uh, the stitching that's on them is just for decoration. It doesn't actually hold anything together. It's just stitched straight through this uh, plastic storm welt, uh, so it's not actually holding any layers together. I will hold layers together for the way I'm going to use it in the end, but, but this thread I'm pulling out isn't actually releasing anything. And if you look carefully at the way that the, the shoes are constructed, actually cement constructed, so this storm welt is not Goodyear welted to the uppers and the footbed. It's actually just glued on with more contact cement and so what's happened here is that the footbeds come loose from the uppers and the place where the shoe flexes. It was actually worse on the right shoe. I'm not going to show that, but uh, by contact cementing it back together and, and then gluing all these layers together, it should be secure for the future. In the end, even though I stitched the soles onto these welts, everything is glued onto those uppers. So in theory, you could just unglue it all and, and pull it apart that way. If I had more time, I could actually go in and uh, recraft these shoes to have a true Goodyear welted pattern. There's enough material left over in the upper that I could actually relast them and uh, stitch them onto the footbed, but I'd have to make a new footbed. I'd have to have a last that fit the shoe. I don't have any of that stuff. And honestly, it's I'm just still starting out, so maybe I'll get to that eventually. Maybe when these soles wear out, I'll redo that the next time. So here you can see the leather I'm using for the midsole is about an 8 ounce leather. It's a veg tan leather I got from Tandy. I always buy the veg tan leather during the Black Friday sales. Uh, you get a really good deal then. This is some uh, 2 to 3 ounce leather I'm going to use for the insole. Again, I bought it at Black Friday sale. So I'm remaking this insole that was originally made with a fake leather and uh, some kind of uh, memory foam. So I'm just going to remake it with real leather. It's about the thickness of the memory foam. And then unusually, 
these shoes have the shank attached to a piece of fiberboard that was glued to the insole. So I'm going to replicate that structure after I make these new leather insoles. I'm going to glue that uh, fiberboard and shank in place. So here I'm marking just so I get it in the right spot so it matches up with the original. That provides a little bit more shape to that insole and some support to the arch, which is nice. It's weird that the shank is actually there on that uh, insole. It, everything's all strapped together when you have the shoe laced down, so it's not going to be a problem, but it's not a structure I've seen before. Now, because this isn't a real Goodyear welt, there's not enough thickness for two layers of this cork. So I'm just putting one layer of cork in. They won't be as padded as they would be if they had a, a deeper void between the welt and the midsole. So yeah, I glued the cork in, doing the lazy thing of just hammering the cork on and then tearing off the pieces that didn't glue down. Now I'm gluing down that uh, fiber board with the shank to the midsole that I or the insole that I made, and it, it fits great. Looks perfect. See there, I re replaced it. I'm gonna go ahead and sign it myself. I started this project in November, and uh, yeah, if you if you have a chance, please go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already. If you like this video, I'm going to do, obviously, more stuff like this. This is what I'm into right now. I also do a lot of work with vintage wristwatches. I'm trying to learn to restore those. And then uh, I've got some projects coming up with uh, my 74 Jensen Healy. And I'm also going to be buying a 1977 Jeep CJ5. So if you're interested in car restoration stuff, too, that'll be coming up this year. So I've got the glue down on the shoe itself on the cork bed and the welt and then I'm also gluing down the midsole this veg tan midsole help hold everything together and give another layer of cushion got to hammer that down what I've discovered is a lot of you are really enjoying the high-speed hammering so I tried to keep all the hammering in didn't cut any out Usually I do a little time lapse through some things that are repetitive, but people really like the hammering, so I kept all of it in. So here I'm just trimming up that midsole so it's as close as possible to the welt. And then I'm going to use the edge of the shoe anvil to tap it down and make sure it's set. So when you're using contact cement, it sticks after it's dried. There's a window, you have to let it dry, and then there's a window you can get it to stick. If you wait too long, you can heat it. That's what a lot of professional cobblers do. But then you also have to put a lot of pressure on it to get it to really set up. If you have a press, you can actually use a hydraulic press to do that. I don't have a hydraulic press set up where I can put the shoe in, so I used to use my hammer. And uh, if you hammer hard enough, then that'll give enough pressure to set up the glue really well and you won't have any issues. I'm going to stitch this too. So the outsole and the midsole are actually going to be stitched through to the welt. So that adds some additional security. But of course, the welt is not sewed to the upper because of the fake Goodyear welt construction here. So it's not as solid as it would be if it was a true Goodyear welted shoe. Honestly, I could have gotten away with no stitching at all because this glue is really effective. Just doing a real close trim up of the rubber. I'm going to take it to the belt sander to clean it up. I have a video that shows how I set up this motor on the belt sander. If you want to watch that, I'll put a card in for it. I, uh, I use the KF94 mask. That's been my go-to uh, COVID mask too. Fits my face pretty good, but uh, also keeps tiny little rubber dust particles out of your lungs as well as uh, COVID viruses. So here I go. When I started out, I, I tried out stitching just onto the surface. I've got some other shoes that have similar soles to these that were machine stitched and they just let the stitches sit on the surface and they wear through, but that's okay because they provide the, really the friction of the stitches running through the sole is what keeps everything together. They don't have to actually be intact on the sole side. But what I discovered was hand stitching. I couldn't follow the stitching line well enough to make it look nice, you can see that the stitches have a kind of a, they're getting cattywampus. They're not all straight. And so what I did was, I don't have a groover that'll cut through this leather. 
or this rubber, excuse me, sole. But what I did was I went ahead and I used my box cutter to cut a shallow ditch in. And so all of the stitches end up going into this shallow ditch. And that helps to hold everything together. It looks really good, I think. So what you can see here is that I got all the way back around. I'm having to pull out those stitches I did at first to make it look better. I'm going to go ahead and cut the ditch through that area too that I initially stitched just onto the surface. And so that way it cleans back up again. I have to cover some space I'd already covered, but that's okay. The other thing I discovered was it looked better. It actually goes twice as fast too if I skipped every other stitch hole from the original machine stitching. So you'll see that's what I've done all the way around on both shoes. I think it's very satisfying to watch that thread go pop into the groove. Put this one in slow motion so you can really see it. Okay, once I'm done, I have to cut off the remaining thread from the first part. I was able to reuse the rest of that thread on the next shoe, and then I have to go through and cut off every place that I started a thread. Uh, so the first thread I used only made it halfway or three quarters of the way around the shoe and so I had to start another one. That's why there's these extra knots I'm cutting off here. Now that the everything's stitched together, that was a tough process. I think it probably took about an hour total to stitch all the way around, maybe a little bit more than that. It would be faster if it was a project I could really set up on a stitching pony, but oh, with the shoe I have to kind of hold it in my hands and do the stitching. It slows it down. So here I'm getting ready for the heels. I had several comments on my Doc Martens video that said that I should put a layer of leather between the heel and the rubber sole. So I'm doing that. Also learned that I should wipe everything down that's rubber with acetone before I glue it to help make sure it glues up better. So that's a step I added for the sole in the second shoe and for these heels. I've got some thin leather. I actually used about a two to three ounce leather instead of the eight ounce leather that I used for the, the main midsole. So these have a, a smaller piece of leather between them and the body of the shoe. And here you see I'm trimming up the leather around the heel so I don't have as much that I have to deal with with the sander. It's a little bit like paring an apple. And then for sanding the heels, I actually used my, my little sander slash uh, burnishing tool I got from Tandy. Just because it was a smaller workpiece, it was a little bit easier to do this than go to the big belt sander. Couldn't get into the concave part as well with the tool, so I used a hand sander. So yeah, you glue the heel on, but that contact cement isn't really intended to keep that heel in place. That's just to hold it in place for the process of nailing it down. And I've got these tacks, and what happens is the tacks actually are longer than the thickness between the heel and the sole. They go all the way through and hit that shoe anvil underneath, and then that causes them to roll over and they actually crimp down. So they add pro they're not just tacking it to the heel, they actually roll over and, and cause that crimping to really lock that heel in, so it's it's not going anywhere. Very securely attached. So I go through and I get them all started at the top level, but then I have to use a, a nail set to get them to run down in, and that's when the actual crimping happens. You'll notice that I'm not using my good leather hammer on this part because I don't want metal tools to hit the face of the leather hammer and cause it to get marred. So I want that leather hammer to stay smooth. So I'm using my little ball peen hammer for this nailing process. Honestly, it's a little bit too small for this process. When I did the other shoe, I used a bigger hammer and it went faster and was easier. But you can see all the little nail heads, all the nail tips crimped around there. Now I've got to go through and get that heel sand it down to even up with the, the sole. One of the other tricks I've learned from watching different cobblers on YouTube uh, is to use the round pulley end and not try to do the shoes on the platen where I do knives. So you'll see all of the sanding here is either on the bottom pulley or the top pulley. I don't show the top pulley work I did, but anyway, I have a smaller pulley on the top I can use for smaller radii. So now it's mostly done. What I'm going to do now is put some 
beeswax onto all the exposed leather edges and then use a piece of canvas, cotton canvas, to burnish them so they get a nice smooth finish. So yeah, I can compare the new one shoe that's done with the one that isn't done there. Now I'm going to skip ahead after having done the second shoe. I'm going to clean and condition the uppers using the Lexol two-step process. The number one is uh, just a cleaner and it goes on. You let it sit for a little bit and then rub it and it gets uh, the surface really clean. Then the second step is actually a conditioner. It goes in and adds uh, oils back to the leather and makes it more supple and lasts longer. So here's the second step. I, I bought this stuff at Oregon Leather Company also. I mean, you can get it online, but I like to buy locally if I can, support local businesses. So this goes in and uh, conditions the leather, makes it last longer. No point in trying to condition that welt, it's plastic. You know, honestly, if I had to do this over again, I might not go the step of actually trying to recraft them into a real good ear welt structure, but I might replace that plastic welt with the real leather one. I've got these leather insoles I made. I don't want to get ruined by my sweaty feet, so I'm going to actually snow seal these. Snow seal is one of the better things I've found for making leather waterproof. And part of the deal is that after you apply it, you have to heat it. I use a hair dryer to just get hot enough. Once it's heated, it melts and ru runs into the pores on the leather, fills it up, and uh, gives it a nice waterproof structure. Get those laces back on. I think I'm going to buy some new red laces to help highlight those red stitches on the sides. And if you look on the back, it actually came from the factory with a single red stitch on the heel. That's what got me the idea of doing the red stitches for the welt. And there you go. It's not perfect, but it, it's better than it was saved these shoes and did it myself total of 55 dollars if i took them to a cobbler it probably cost 80 dollars or more for the recrafting and i wouldn't get the hand stitched uh, welts this is later after i'd used them for a week you can see some wear and tear on the shoes some dirt from walking off road if i have an etsy shop where i sell some of my leather goods i make these keychains they have a silver dollar concho on them, so it's actually made out of pewter, it's not silver, but that's good because an actual silver dollar wouldn't last on a key ring, it would just get worn out from the keys rubbing on it. These last very well. I've got uh, the front back of the piece silver dollar, I also have the Morgan silver dollar, but right now I only have the back side in stock. I'm going to make some more with the Lady Liberty part. Right now I only have my own Morgan Lady Liberty to show off. This one's like five years old, so you can see they last really well. They get a kind of a patina on them. I think it's a pretty neat keychain. Anyway, look on my website for those $15 on my Etsy store. And thanks for watching. Again, if you haven't had a chance to, please stop and subscribe. Like this video. Leave a comment. Tell me how you do things differently. And thanks for your time. Appreciate it.